Greetings and welcome back to the Kiss My Aesthetic podcast. I'm so excited to have fellow brand designer and one concept met- method fanatic Haley on the podcast. Welcome <laughs> to the podcast. Hi. Thanks for having oh me. Gosh. I'm so excited to be here. Likewise. I think that we have been following each other on social for so long. I don't even know how long at this point, but definitely like height of A the while. pandemic years, right? Yeah. With TikTok. Yeah. Um, and I am obsessed with your style. I think that you're so freaking talented. And so I was so excited that you agreed to come on the podcast. So this is such a, a fun moment for us. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Likewise. I know I love what everything that you're doing. So I'm excited to oh, be here. Oh, very cool. Yay. And I think you're just barely my neighbor to the North. I'm down in San Diego. Yeah. I'm in Carpinteria, which is like a tiny little beach town south of Santa Barbara. So just a little bit north of you. Love it. So for anyone who doesn't know you and doesn't follow you yet, can you tell us who you are and what you do and who you help? Yeah. So I'm Haley Fetters. um, My pronouns are she, her. I am the founder of Studio Seaside and we help online businesses with branding and web design, primarily Squarespace and Shopify. And then more recently, I have been helping um, fellow brand designers with streamlining their branding process and implementing the one concept method into their process. Um, And so, yeah, I'm excited to be here and chat more about all those things. All the fun, nitty gritty designer Mm -hmm. stuff, all the stuff that I feel like you maybe (laughs) don't learn in school. Can you take us back to kind of how you got started and did you study graphic design in, in school? Yeah, I did. I studied graphic design in San Francisco at San Francisco state uh, and the year that I graduated, I also got pregnant. Um, so mm. I was pregnant and job hunting and that was proved to be kind of difficult. I did land a job. And then once I told them I was pregnant, they decided not to hire me, um, oh, no. which is super illegal, but I didn't know that at the time. And so I kind of accepted defeat and decided to start a design blog. Cause I didn't really want, I didn't want to give up. I wanted to use my degree and stay pr- productive and kind of keep learning design and build my portfolio. And that design blog kind of snowballed into people asking me to design things for them. And then from there, I ended up, you know, after my baby was old enough, got a kind of part-time job and then worked on the side with graphic design. And eventually after my second child was born, I took it full time and built my studio into what it is today. So it's been kind of a slow growth, which I'm totally Mm -hmm. fine with. Mm -hmm. And I always tell designers to, to be okay with going slow. Like it doesn't have to happen overnight. Um, and yeah, I don't think I would change the journey that, that I have been on, even though it was a lot of ups and downs. (laughs) No, definitely. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. That's the same with me. I started in 2014. So this is like Mm -hmm. year nine. So anyone that's looking at my stuff today and trying to compare it to their year one, I have Mm -hmm. to remind them like, no, 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 no. Like it took a long time to get here. Yeah, absolutely. I know. And that's, I mean, there are things that I wish that I knew sooner and that's Mm. why I love to help fellow designers. Cause like there are things that I'm thinking like, wow, if I knew this sooner then I would have been able to get from, from A to B a little bit quicker or start raising my rates sooner. Cause I was severely Mm -hmm. undercharging for so long. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I do, that's like where the passion for helping fellow designers comes from is, providing as much information that I wish that I knew when starting out that they don't teach you in design school because they prepare you for like getting stuff print ready, but they don't prepare you for creating your portfolio or interviewing for a job or um, being a freelance designer. And there's so much work that goes into that, that you don't learn in school. So. And the space has changed so much since we started. Like, mm-hmm. thank goodness for the internet, right? But I, I joke with my parents all the time because my mom has her own business. My grandmother, my great-grandmother, they all owned their own businesses. And it's wild that just even in a few generations, like the access to information has grown so vastly. You know what I mean? Um, and I, like you, I learned so much about business just from following people that I thought were inspiring and learning from them on the internet for free. So it does kind of feel this like pay it forward kind of energy. Mm -hmm. I feel like you have that a lot with, with your account and with your socials is really sharing with people like, no, this is how this comes together. This is how this got made. Have you always been like that? Or were you shy about kind of pulling back the curtain in the beginning? Um, no, I think I've kind of always been like that. I think in the beginning I used it as 
a tool to honestly, like almost teach myself, like, cause mm. my design blog, that's kind of how I started. And it was like me just kind of, it was like the early days of blogging when I don't think anybody really even read my blog, but um, <laughs> <laughs> like I'd probably be horrified to go back and look and see what it was. Um, but it was really just me uh, use, using it as a tool to like teach myself uh, mm-hmm. and just like put content out kind of. So I'd be like, this is a logo that I did and I this is my process through it. So I've always just kind of put content out there. And then as I started to have my own freelance design business, I realized how powerful blogging was for SEO. So I used mm-hmm. that as a tool um, to educate like my ideal client about, um, you know, why they should hire a graphic designer for their business. And, um, and so using it as a tool that way. And then, so it just kind of naturally progressed to be like, okay, um, th- this is transition to helping fellow designers um, and in like an educational sure. way. But like you said, like, I think there's such a difference between the online business world and like brick and mortar stores where yeah. online businesses um, do, you can, you can learn anything online. And I think that there is like that um, tendency to share more education and connect with fellow business owners that way. Um, and so naturally that's just kind of like the content that I put out is more educational in that sense. Let's talk a little bit to the client side. If you could describe on the whole, like what kind of clients that you work for and what your style is, like what's your differentiation factor? Um, mm-hmm. How do you kind of describe that with within everything that you've like learned and grown over the last uh, almost decade, right? Like it's been yeah. a, a while, it's just like me. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. Because uh, yeah, I've got to so... imagine your styles also change. Like <clears throat> I, I just know from my experience, like when I was first designing things, I was so shy to put my name on it because I didn't want anyone to know that it was me because I was insecure mm-hmm. about being so young. Like I felt mm-hmm. like I hacked my way into like mm-hmm. people paying me money. And so mm-hmm. I never wanted my name on anything. And if people saw it and they said, oh my gosh, this is so good. Did you do that? I'm like, yeah, maybe. Like it was all like coy <laughs> yeah. because I thought well, that was the biggest like compliment. <laughs> totally, yeah. totally, totally. But there's some things I look back on in my, like I've dug up my old base camp folder the other day and like found old projects. And I was like, Oh God, yeah. <laughs> do you oh have God. that with some of your beginning? Oh, absolutely. Work? Like so much. Like I, I looked back at the first logo I ever got paid to design. Um, and it was like horrific, but I was so ecstatic to be paid for my design, mm-hmm. you know, and they got what they paid for. <laughs> yeah. But budget wise. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. I look back and I'm like, but that's part of the journey, right? Like no one's going to come totally. out of design school or s- their first year of design, like producing these amazing work, like, and, and your style evolves over time. Um, so yeah, like client facing wise currently now, um, we say that we help creative online brands, um, and then unofficially we lean towards more, um, like travel brands. So I live in, uh, kind of a touristy town. So we do have a lot of Airbnbs, like boutique hotels, cool. um, hospitality. Um, and I really enjoy that. And so we try to, uh, portray that through like our aesthetic on our website and, um, on social media. <clears throat> Um, but that's not to say that we don't do like e- e-commerce builds or people who come sure. along that, that need stuff. Um, and then as far as style, like we do really try to keep it, um, pretty timeless and like trends are fun, but they go out of style. So we do like to try to, um, lead clients in a direction of a brand that will withstand any trends. Um, and then I, I don't think I'm like super minimal, but you probably would maybe describe my work that way. <laughs> Oh, well, because so, I'm, yeah. my style is way over the top sometimes. I look at your stuff, I'm like, man, it's so clean. <laughs> sometimes yeah. I feel like there's also a difference between a designer that gravitate towards um, like serif fonts. Mm-hmm. And I I just like serifs and I do just, we just do not get along. That doesn't mean I can't do it. I just uh-huh. don't have, I feel like sometimes with my design style, I don't have a good enough grip of how serifs like actually function for brands mm-hmm. because I always run into the issue of it being too thin. 
Do you yeah. have this? Do you have this mm-hmm. problem? Like I have such a, I'm not a typography, like super strong typography base because I'm a fine arts and art history major. Like I didn't mm-hmm. study design. I didn't learn graphic design, the inner workings. Like I luckily have some designers on my team now that have like master's degrees in graphic design. Uh-huh. And I'm like, <laughs> I never learned any of this. So um, it's interesting because I think, I think that it's funny, like which styles people gravitate towards, but yeah, like mm-hmm. on the spectrum of yours and mine, like, I think you're definitely, you have a much more refined minimalism. I tend mm-hmm. to go a little overboard with like, yeah, <laughs> but I love that. The Honestly, I, I look at like <laughs> designers that can do like more maximalism stuff. And I'm like, sure. I love it. Like, I feel like I can't do it, you know? Huh, I, interesting. I, I, and I don't know if it's part of like my, I have my like design professor in my mind being like, take away every possible thing that you can until it really? like works, you know, like ah. always like refine, 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 like what can you remove to still have it work? Um, okay. and I think I, I'm always have that. that. That's kind of my like thinking in design. Sure. Um, but I feel like there is like a, a draw towards more maximalism, even just like cur- coming, we're going that way and I love it. And I wish that I, um, was better at it. <laughs> oh my but gosh. That's just it's how constantly I was evolving. <laughs> well, yeah. it's, it's, it's a pendulum, right? And I think like mm-hmm. we've been at it long enough to see that things, things come in and out of style, but there's having a brand that really works. And a lot of our process is about finding, like rooting it in a lot of history and rooting it in a lot of um, like context, geographical context mm-hmm. of how, what makes sense for this place and space and time so that, that you get that timeless. So even if it does look over the top and super colorful and lots of patterns and assets and, and like fun flings to it, that it has, mm-hmm. it still has a timeless element. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's really a big difference here. in what we're talking about the difference between a logo and a brand Mm-hmm. You are a big fan of the one concept method. I made a video about the one concept method yesterday that got way more response than I was anticipating because <laughs> I was showing how when I was a baby designer and mm-hmm. someone was paying me $800 for a logo, I started by giving them 16 options and yeah. then we narrowed down to eight and then we narrowed down to two and uh-huh. then we played with color. And yeah. like, I don't know why I thought to do it that way. Mm-hmm. Other than I, I wanted to make sure that they felt like they were getting their money's worth. I think that mm-hmm. that was like the biggest thing. And that if I only showed them one idea, that somehow that wasn't worth it. But man, once I switched over to one concept method, like my whole world changed, mm-hmm. changed. So I'm wondering yeah. what your path was with that and how you kind of describe it to clients as like a value add instead of a, um, well, you're only giving me one idea. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, to your point about like, you didn't know why you gave so many options. I think as new designers, we lack the confidence to be able to decide which is the best yeah. option. And we look, we look to the client to decide. And I, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I don't think that the one concept method is necessarily for newer designers. Sure. Um, and so it's, it does take a certain amount of confidence in your skills and your ability to solve the client's problem to um, be able to make that decision. So once you feel that you're able to do that, then it's time to transition to that method if you feel like it's right for you. Um, but as far as clients go, I, I definitely talk about it a lot um, in uh, social media. So they, they usually come mm-hmm. to me knowing that I use this process. And then um, I, I talk about it on a sales call. And then I also talk about it in the proposal as well as mm-hmm. the contract. Um, mm-hmm. And we frame it by saying, you know, um, you're coming to us as a creative expert and for our creative expertise and opinion. And um, we're going to try every possible design um, variation behind the scenes. And Mm -hmm. then we're going to decide which we feel is best for you and your business. And then we're going to present that as a complete concept. Um, And they're aware of that, like from the beginning. So Mm -hmm. um, they're never surprised that they get just one concept. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not ever just like a single logo on a white background. It's um, a full suite developed um, and they are allowed to have feedback and input um, and they're allowed edits if needed. Um, but the nice thing about the process that I've refined and kind of um, used over time is that revisions are often um, like zero, which is so wild, but um, I know they right? do happen. They do happen, which is fine. But um, it has like significantly cut down on revisions. It's, it's 
amazing. I feel like I used oh my to gosh, just like, right? And that was endless. the worst part <laughs> is because no matter what, if you give someone, it, it goes back to sales psychology, right? If you give someone 40 options, they're mm-hmm. going to start to Frankenstein their own solution together. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's better to give them one super, super solid option because then they're, they're, what they're looking for also should have been communicated in that discovery process. And I feel like Mm -hmm. I I say this to potential clients a lot is like, by the time you're seeing your brand presentation, you shouldn't actually should not be surprised. It should be pretty clear. Like, because you've Mm -hmm. signed off on the visual direction, we've had the discovery Mm -hmm. call, we've had the brand questionnaire, we've talked endlessly about this project that really, by the time you see the presentation, it's just crystallizing everything that we've already Mm -hmm. discussed. It sounds, you're nodding along. It sounds like that's similar to you. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. That's like a crucial step um, in the process is, well, we have like a strategy or discovery session um, and, and then a creative direction that's kind of rooted in that strategy. Um, and they're, it's essential that they see that and approve it. Um, so that when the design comes, it's like you said, it's not a surprise. It's kind of just, okay, yeah, that makes sense. This is what I like, you know, maybe a small tweak here or there. Um, and then we'll go from there. And that's, and I, I, and that's like majority of the projects I do occasionally, cause people always say like, well, what happens if they do want changes? Mm-hmm. Like that's a pretty frequently asked question. Um, and it's fine. Like you get, they get yeah. three rounds of revisions. Um, a round is as many changes that they would like to see given to me at one time. Um, and I have had people kind of like totally be like, you know what? I, my bad, I was wrong uh-huh. <laughs> now that I see it. Um, uh-huh. Um, I kind of want to see it a little bit differently and that's fine. Like, so sometimes we do end up a little bit differently than where I, than where, um, we started, but it's still within those rounds of revisions. And I don't ever feel like I'm going out of scope or Same. being taken advantage of as far as, um, the like amount of designs that we're, that we're putting together. So, um, it's really just been life changing. <laughs> So totally. that's why I and always talk about it. Cause it's like, I want every designer, if they feel burnt out by creating too many, uh, options, if they feel burnt out by endless revisions, then like it's time to start thinking about using this method. Same, same. And I feel like because now I have a clear process where there's clear deliverables and there's a cr- clear start and stop and mm-hmm. they're onboarded in that way, it actually makes me feel more free to come up with better ideas mm-hmm. instead of yeah. having to interpret feedback from a client and then spit out, like try to read their mind all the time. Mm-hmm. Like I think now, because I know that like, okay, on Wednesdays is when I design logos and we have two weeks between the the brand questionnaire all the way through to the logo presentation. So I can really actually chew on the idea. And it's this thing with creatives where like our brains are never truly off. Like mm-hmm. if I'm grocery shopping, I'm still thinking about the logo that I'm going to oh, yeah. do on Wednesday. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of that, but that's the beauty of it, right? It's like finding discipline within the freedom of being mm-hmm. able to like actually sink your teeth into it and get into the nitty gritty. But, but because you have kind of the bumpers up on the bowling lane, you're not, you don't feel like you're uh, it's unpredictable. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you get, do you get what I'm saying? I'm using a lot Absolutely. of like abstract yeah. analogies. Like no, I usually I feel do. The same way. I do feel that my creativity has um, grown. Yeah. Since using this method, I've been able to explore, um, like paths that I don't necessarily think I would have gone down had I been constrained to like what the client, um, wanted. I have found also that, um, as I've started to position myself as like, I like to call it a creative expert, um, Mm -hmm. who uses this method, people seek me out like specifically for that. They're like, okay, Mm -hmm. this, this, I don't want to see three options. I want somebody Mm -hmm. to walk me through it and um, help me decide and come up with the best option instead of me like micromanaging and like standing over my shoulder and design. Basically, Mm -hmm. like you have your hand on the mouse. the mouse. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Um, And so I have found that people um, want to work with me specifically because I use this method. Um, Yeah. So that's nice too. No, it's super nice. And I I feel similarly, like it's really, it's cool to have someone come to you because they've been able to see what you can accomplish for someone else as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's so important for people to share their work online. Like, I think there's a lot of, again, like newbie designers that just want to share resources or here's an illustrator hack or here's this, which are all Mm -hmm. great. Like those are all helpful, but you're, that's not positioning you as solving the problem for the client necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you see this a lot? 
Yeah, I do. Um, and I definitely did the same thing too. I think it's like, like I said, like with my blog, it was almost like a way of like me teaching myself. Like I would discover sure. these things sure. like, oh, okay, great. Like this is how you set up Google My Business. I'm going to make a blog post about that. Same. Um, here's how, you, here's and, how I made a Gmail signature. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And which is great. Cause like, you know, you just got to get content out there, but that's not necessarily what you want to be known for. Um, but yeah. So I definitely did that in the beginning or I do see designers do that now um, where I think there needs to be more of a mix between like showing the end product. Um, and, and, but, you know, perhaps too, it's the case of like, if you're really new, you might not have like an end product to show. Nope. Um, and so in that case, I always tell people to just make it up. Like I have, I have this like super old book of um, like prompts basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I, there's tons of like online creative brief um, totally stuff that you can do, but, um, you know, like to take one of those and like make a post about your process with that. Like I have found that I get the most client inquiries through the content of me showing the process of my, um, brand identity or website creation. Um, Ditto. because people are like, Oh, like that's what it's, that's what it is. That's what I need, you know? Um, mm-hmm. instead of being like three things that your website needs, like, they already uh-huh. know they their website needs that and they're they're too busy to like DIY it themselves um and take care mm-hmm. of it. They're looking for somebody to, to do it for them. So show them that result um and let them know like why they should work with you. My dog is barking. Hey buddy. That's okay. Wilson. <laughs> Um, is there a part of the design process that you like better than the other parts? Like I love the time where I can sit down and start actually like put, going on TikTok live. Cause this is what, this is part of my process and mm-hmm. committing to like having three to four hour brain dump. Here's everything that I've got for this project so far, like pulling it into the presentation. Also mock-ups are the mm-hmm. best. I love making mock-ups. Do you have yeah. something that you love versus something that you dislike in that process? Um, I, I dislike, this is probably really bad. I dislike the strategy. Oh. I just like, I just like writing. I'm just not like a writer. Um, yes. I've been yes. actually thinking and about as a designer, how I, yeah, totally. It's, it's yeah. so baked into what we do though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And being able, and like, and I believe in it. <clears throat> it's so important. And like everything that I design needs to have um, that foundation and like be rooted in that strategy but it's hard for me to like put it into words and that's just my mm-hmm. brain and how it works. I've actually been thinking about how we can, how I could maybe use like chat GPT to like get me prompts. Um, and then I can edit from there. I haven't oh, quite explored it yet, but I think I might start doing that. Um, oh, it's the best. I'm obsessed with chat GPT. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh so my gosh. I don't love like creating that strategy document. Um, I do like putting the creative direction together, which is at the end of that document. So like from creative direction to, um, creating, like, I love creating custom logo types. Like that is like my, um, absolute like favorite thing to do. So creative direction to creating the logo type, um, is like my favorite part. Yeah. And then mock-ups, um, it depends. (laughs) Sometimes they're tedious. Sometimes um, they are. Sometimes they're super tedious and sometimes they like, they end up becoming this just mammoth of the thing. Cause you're like, how far do I want to go into this? Like, yeah. okay. Yeah. They probably are going to need a magazine at some point, but am I really going to mock up like 18 pages? <laughs> like, uh-huh. not really? Yeah. Like, yeah. am I going to use lorem ipsum or am I going to write like a dummy paragraph, which this is where chat GPT could help you. And the best yeah. trick with chat GPT is you can use it to brainstorm. Mm-hmm. So you can say like, like for my brand photo video shoot, Um, I was going to do an interview segment and I basically said like, can you help me come up with a three minute script that describes why our clients like to work with us and ask me one question at a time. And so if you say that, that one liner into chat GPT, it will give you like brainstorm questions. Like who are you trying to target? And then you tell it and it's like, Mm -hmm. well, what are their biggest problems? And then you're like, you tell it that. And then I ended up giving it like five of our best client testimonials. And it like collated okay. all the information from the testimonials of like the reasons why the clients actually like to work with us, which of course is the creativity and design, but actually it's our process and our organization was mm-hmm. what they were most impressed by and mm-hmm. why they would want to keep coming back, which it kind of goes against like what I would assume is why people want to yeah. work with us. But uh-huh. it is interesting. It's a fabulous tool. It's a fabulous awesome. tool. Yeah. I'm going to start um, utilizing it. I think I saw 
I follow this woman on Instagram um, and she's going to do, I signed up for her wait list to do her course on it because nice. God, lo- God knows I love a course. So, Oh my gosh, wait, <laughs> send it to me. Another one. <laughs> I will. And I, I need to interview like a chat GPT AI expert for the pod. Like yeah. I definitely need someone on here who can tell me like, these are the capabilities. This is what's coming down the pipeline. Um, because I'm a big, uh, I like to embrace new technology, mm-hmm. especially new platforms. Yeah. Are you an mm-hmm. early adopter to platforms or are you kind um, of a, let me see how that goes first. It kind of depends. I, I try to think that I am, I don't have a ton of time. So sometimes yeah. I'm like, I love, I love a good bandwagon, but at the same time, I'm like, Ooh, do I want to really put my, my energy into this? Um, I think it's essential for, um, entrepreneurs and like everybody in general, really to just like stay on top of, um, things as far as technology and how to utilize them in your business and your life. Um, because otherwise like you're going to get left behind, like things are going to evolve whether you like it or not. And you got to stay up to date on it. Um, yeah. And like chat GPT is coming. Like it's not, I don't think it's coming to take over our our jobs, but like it's going to make our lives easier and we might as well learn how to utilize it so that um, we don't get left behind. So there was some interesting sentiment about it in my Facebook group because I had posted about how I can actually download the tran- transcripts from these podcasts and give it mm-hmm. to ChatGPT, and ChatGPT mm. can read them and generate blog posts out of them Love that it. are like subject related. So, can you create yeah. a thousand word blog post with five different talking points, and then I can use that as a script for a TikTok or something mm-hmm. else, or use it as a caption? Like, there's just a lot of capabilities. And I posted this in the Facebook group, and somebody said like, "Oh, this makes me sick to my stomach." There goes my job as copywriter. Mm. And I'm like, yes, but no. I said, mm-hmm. like, you're getting your time back. Like, if yeah. you can leverage this as a tool, and I talked about this on the last interview with with Amber, it's like calculators didn't put accountants out of business. Like mm-hmm. it's a yeah, it's a tool. Exactly. So yeah. so she goes, okay, I guess I just have to find the clients that don't know what chat GPT is. And I said, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. <laughs> like you need to be yeah. as transparent as possible. You say, Hey, yeah. I'm going to leverage this tool. And instead of just generating one blog post for you in an hour, mm-hmm. I'm going to have a blog post, 10 tweets, three different calls to action an entire email blast and, and 12 social media captions for you. Yeah. And exactly. that's so worth it to the client. So it's like, mm-hmm. we have to remember like, who is the person that you're trying to serve? And how do you use the tools in your back pocket to your advantage, but be transparent about it? Like, I think that the mm-hmm. transparency is really key. What do you think about all that yeah. stuff? Yeah, I agree. Um, and I know I even told my VA the other day, I was like, we were talking about um, just projects coming up. And I was like, you mm-hmm. know, if you, cause she writes a lot of my content now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, use chat GPT, like by all means, like go mm-hmm. for it, you know, like see how we can utilize it to make our, um, lives easier. And at the same time, I think like your point is so valid. Like it's not taking away anyone's job. It's just making them that making it easier for, for people. Mm-hmm. So I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, hop on, hop on it all. <laughs> hop on. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be an interesting space to watch. I think, um, I think also with TikTok, there were a lot of people that were really hesitant about TikTok mm-hmm. when it first came out. I mean, there's still some hesitation about TikTok with all the like current news mm-hmm. happenings and legislation, which is a whole other can of worms. Um, but I remember getting on TikTok in the early days and people saying, oh, I would never get on that platform. It's just teenagers dancing. And mm-hmm. I was like, you're missing a huge opportunity. Huge, yeah. huge. Yeah. So tell us tell us your TikTok come up story um, because you've found some, some success and some clients from TikTok as well. Yeah. Yeah. Tons of, uh, my biggest, uh, client source is TikTok. Last year it was. Um, Same. and so, and then also I've been able to grow like a community of fellow designers on there as well, which is probably my favorite part of it. Um, mm-hmm. but I hopped on TikTok. Um, I think it was 2020. It was like probably like the summertime 2020. I was just feeling like so, over Instagram feeling like mm-hmm. I couldn't, um, I had been doing it since the beginning. I never could like crack the code, um, never felt cool enough. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to try TikTok. Um, and I, I went into it being like, okay, I'm a brand designer. I know that I need to like niche myself down here. Um, and so I think that worked to my advantage Just like immediately I was like, okay, I'm a, um, I'm a brand and web designer. I help fellow designers with design. And I started just talking about my process right away. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
my uh, people were asking a lot of questions like, why well, you only deliver one concept? Like what's the one concept method? Um, and so that's kind of how my um, profile there grew is like talking about the one concept method. And then I also started talking about um, what I charge and like pricing for mm-hmm. branding projects um, because I also believe that pricing transparency is essential for designers to talk about. Um, and so that is where I saw growth and a lot of like awareness around um, my content as well over there is talking about pricing mm-hmm. for designers. So yeah. And it's been awesome to connect with um, fellow designers and then, and then the, my process videos that I do share um, send a lot of leads my way. And then I've like, I've been able to do um, like collaborations with some bigger brands. Like I did an Adobe live cause they saw me cool. on TikTok, which was like, so amazing. Um, and, and then like some other paid collaborations, um, with nice. brands has been really nice too. So yeah, it's been a really interesting journey. I feel like it's changed a little bit over the past, like even six months. Um, mm-hmm. there's definitely more designers on there, which is great. Um, so you have to be a little bit even more specific about totally your content that you're putting out, which is totally, fine. Totally. Totally. Yeah. What are kind of your favorite things? You said growing your the designer community has definitely been one of your favorite things. I love your pricing videos because I find them fascinating. And I think it's so interesting. Um, just to like, like you said, p- pricing transparency is hugely important. My mm-hmm. prices are on my website. Like I, I also believe in the same thing, but I'm mm-hmm. wondering from TikTok, because the beauty of TikTok is that you get eyeballs from all over looking yeah. at your content. <laughs> and then the ugly part about TikTok is you get eyeballs from all over looking at your content. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious how you deal with some of the, I'm sure, unsolicited feedback about the pricing of branding and what branding actually costs. How do you yeah. tackle all of that in the TikTok space? Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, it's crazy. In this, in one video, I'll have people be like, that you're undercharging. That's way too much, like too little. And then have it be like another comment be, I don't understand how anybody could like charge this. Like this is a crap design, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it really, <laughs> it's just like, at this point, it's just kind of noise and I can yeah. I decide like who to reply to or not. It did bother me. It, it did give me a little bit of anxiety in the beginning. It felt a little too vulnerable um, sure. to be sharing that. But the feedback that I did get from designers overwhelmingly was like, this is so helpful. Thank you. And ultimately I was like, you know what? That's why I'm posting it. I'm not posting it for like tech bros who think that Squarespace is the worst and like, you know, that I shouldn't be using it or charging $10,000 for a website. Um, I'm posting it for designers that are charging $1,000 for a website and didn't know that it was possible to be able to charge more, um, for your design or be able to like make a living as a designer. Um, so just reminding myself, like why, who I'm posting it for. Sometimes it does feel like if you, I get it. Like if you landed on my page and you saw the first video you saw was me talking about how I charged $20,000 for a project. I, I too would probably be like, this girl is like a look at me girl, you know? And, um, Uh And so I get it. I get where some of like the hate comes from or it's not even hate. It's just like, um, misunderstanding, misconception. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think as you dive deeper, you see that like genuinely it's from a place of wanting to help fellow designers. And I do talk a lot about like, just because this is what I charge in me and for me and my business, it doesn't mean that it's what you need to charge for yours. It really comes down to like, your years of experience, your expertise, your geographical location, and then ultimately the client and the problem that you're solving for them. Absolutely. Um, That all goes into pricing. Um, But here's a look at a project and what I charged. And perhaps you can think about going up and down, up or down from there. And there's a difference. There's a nuance between this is what I charge for a project versus this is what me, I designer made as income. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, I think absolutely. that that's, that's a huge gap that I notice in, in entrepreneurship and online entrepreneurship is there's a lot of people that lead with my agency made $800,000 this year. And you're like, whoa, mm-hmm. whoa, 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 yeah. <laughs> like slow down. Like that's not really painting the whole picture. Mm-hmm. Whereas here's a project that I did for a client and I charged X, Y, Z, um, mm-hmm. because it's solved. ABC problem. Like that's mm-hmm. a hugely different position. And I think that that's worth noting because they're, they're, it, like you're saying, it's coming from a place of transparency. It's coming from a place of helping instead of like a 
boasting and like, you should follow me because I'm successful. It's like, no, you mm-hmm. should follow me because I do quality work. Yeah. That's at least been my position in the whole thing. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And like, no matter what, people are going to misunderstand and feel annoyed by you. And I, that's yeah, not my so problem. Like, game. I really yeah. can't do that. <laughs> my True. therapist would be very proud of me for like just brushing that shit off. Like as a people pleaser, uh-huh. you know, it's like one bad comment used to just like spiral me. And now I just, whatever. I honestly, now I like to just be really snarky and, um, yeah. And annoying back to people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, cause that brings me joy, but, or just blocking people too. It's like, yep. Okay. We love bye. a block button. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. No, it's well, because it's biological, like it's mm-hmm. biological for us to take criticism harsh. Like mm-hmm. that's, it's part of our survival. Like, of course, if someone says something that's biting or aggressive or, or demeaning, like you're going to remember it because it's your, your brain's way of reminding you that you don't like feeling like that, like, mm-hmm. or that you don't like that kind of energy around you. Like that's, it's very, they talk about it a lot on armchair expert podcast. I don't mm. know if you're a, a armchair I've listened expert to that before, but I, not recently. It's good stuff. Um, but they talk about that a lot too, about how like criticism and feedback and all of these things, like it starts to affect your self-concept when you let it get to you in that way mm-hmm. versus yeah. versus just acknowledging that like the reason it feels icky is because it's actually like your biology kind of protecting you about not getting yourself in a situation like that again. Mm-hmm. It's very fascinating. I love listening yeah. to all that kind of stuff. I'm such a nerd for podcasts. I'm like a love of podcasts. Yeah. I've been, I do too. And I feel like, I think honestly, did you ever listen to this being boss? No. So that being was like boss. the, it was, um, Kathleen Shannon and Emily M Thompson. Um, I discovered their podcast and that they like opened my eyes to like the whole online business world. Yeah. And so, and this was years ago, um, when I first started and I was really, really into business podcasts and all kinds of podcasts. Yeah. And how and I then, built this, Jenna Kutcher. Yeah, all of them. Yep. All of them. I just like yep. everything, just like online courses. I was like, give it all to me. Um, and then I was like, yeah, I gotta take a break. <laughs> so I haven't yeah. like done business podcasts in a while. I've been more like true crime, but um Oh, we love a true crime I, moment. Yeah. Being boss. I think they still have a podcast, but I would recommend that even um now for people who are just starting out in the online business world. Um for sure. Great recommendation. For sure. Big audiobook person too. So yes. uh, yeah, me too. there's like, there's some real zingers. There's actually, um, one that I just downloaded yesterday. I haven't started yet by Rick Rubin, who's the producer mm-hmm. of Def Jam records. Mm-hmm. And he like produced like Jay-Z 99 problems. He worked with BC boys. He worked with like, and he did a whole book on creativity. Let me pull it up because Ooh. I'm going to butcher the title, but he talked about like getting yourself to creative flow and what that actually means as, as a creative person and how to kind of leverage your creativity, but not force it. And so he was on literally armchair expert yesterday and was talking about how, um, it's called the creative act by Rick Rubin. Okay. Um, and it's supposed to be fabulous, but I really liked everything that he was saying so far about how, when you're trying to work through a creative idea, you can't force it. Mm-hmm. You can't force it. And you need to, um, you need to move your body and you mm-hmm. need to move your being and that mm-hmm. how the, his best idea is like if he found himself kind of hitting his head against the wall in the studio he'd like go for a walk go for a swim mm-hmm. and it's when you finally let go of trying to force it that the idea just you get the download right like yeah. it just comes to you and I resonated with that so hard like if I'm ever trying mm-hmm. to force something or I'm having like a terrible day like I can't just continue to sit there and try to power through it's mm-hmm. I'm gonna make shit work and I'm gonna hate it yeah yeah so I'm I'm excited to dive into that book because I think um it'll be good but we should start yeah. a little designer book club. Oh, I love that idea. Wouldn't that's that be a good fun? idea. Yeah. So I feel like I, you've um, got sources that I don't know and I maybe have yeah. some things you don't know and that could be cool. I would love that. I know. I, I'm in a book club with my um, girlfriends and it's like nice. so fun. <laughs> I never thought yeah. that I would um, have right? so much fun. Welcome to your late 30s. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's really fun and I do Audible and so I um, yeah. listen to them all and then, yeah, go for my walks and I... Um, since I've been doing that, I definitely feel, uh, weight off my shoulders throughout the day where I'm like, okay, I'm going to get through this so I can go for my walk. And then I'm going to get back and feel energized and like continue where I used to just like grind it out, you know, but, um, yeah. And I think that's, that resonates with me also that, um, what he says about creativity. So, yeah. And you got two kiddos, right? Yeah. So um, you're going to go spend time with them. 
Yes. <laughs> they, that's fun. I know. Well, that's, I think that's part of me always um, feeling like I have to like sit down and just like get all my work done in sure. one time because I have only ever had like these blocks of time to get it done. Um, right. And so that is like, for me, it's like good and bad. Like it's nice to have like dedicated time, but sure. it, it can lead to overwhelm feeling like, Oh, I didn't get this done today. And now like mm-hmm. there's not really any chance because by eight o'clock tonight, I'm going to be totally fried. I'm not going to sit down mm-hmm. and design anything. Mm-hmm. Um, like the guests will have mm-hmm. to get it done tomorrow. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, but, it, but at the same time, it does pull me away from my computer and allows me to not work 12 yeah. hours straight. Oh so. yeah. That's me and my dog. I mean, he has mm-hmm. to go for a walk for an hour every day. So yeah. if he doesn't, I'm going to be paying for it by 5 PM. So, uh, yeah. um, yeah, I, it's it, but it is one of those things where it's like, now it's blocked in my calendar. Like I can't take a client mm-hmm. call during that time. I'm not going to not do it because it, it has to. And it's helped my mental health probably in more ways than I give it mm-hmm. credit for of like, just get out there, walk, listen to something, learn something, get some fresh air and then come back and, and attack it. You know, it's really, yeah. really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, cool. You have two very cool things going on. So you have savvy series and you have brand process happy. Tell mm-hmm. us everything, who it's for, what it's all about, how people can um, learn more information. Cause I think they're going to want to by the end of this. Yeah. So, um, brand process savvy is my signature course for freelancers who are wanting to move more towards being creative experts with their branding Mm -hmm. process. Um, and so we cover pricing the one concept method and then just the general process for, um, what I carry my clients through with the branding process. Um, and so that is a, you know, self-paced course that you can go through. Um, and enrollment is, Right now it's evergreen, but I think I'm about to close it and do a little couple updates to the course and okay. then um, relaunch it in the summer. So um, nice. stay tuned for that. And then Savvy Series is more for newer to freelance designers who are just started getting started with um, finding clients and setting yeah. up kind of their systems and processes and learning about the different pricing structures um, and so as far as pricing goes, that one is a little bit more attainable and then, um, brand process savvy, like I said, it's like my signature course. So, yeah. um, yeah. And people can find them both on my website, sign up for wait lists and, um, Yay. there's some freebies to download there too. In the meantime, if they're not open for enrollment when they do land on the site. So, so as a course lover, how fun was it creating your own course? <clears throat> it was fun. Actually, I actually really enjoy it. Um, surprisingly as much as I hate writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It just kind of flows out, and then um, and and then creating the slides. Like I, I actually really, really like it. Um, yeah. And if I could transition to just do that, I would probably be pretty stoked. So yeah, yeah. nice, yeah. nice. You feel and the I'm same sure, way? Yeah, I I have. Uh, that's kind of how I've treated this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, is the podcast is kind of my way, same thing of like this is my way of talking about things that I think are interesting with a fellow creatives. And then I was running during the pandemic, some, some portfolio challenges, Mm -hmm. um, the kiss my portfolio challenge, which was really fun. I haven't, I don't know that I have the attention span to sit down and create an entire course, which is, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is my hold back on it. And my biggest fear is that you make a whole course, then the information is outdated. Yeah. Uh, So you gotta, it is, does take up. Yeah. Unless mm-hmm, you are te- teaching like you are, which is like you're teaching really the tenets of creating a design agency and a design business, mm-hmm. which I think are pretty probably pretty timeless topics. Um, but yeah, it's that's it's I always look at it as this mammoth. This would be this mammoth undertaking. But mm-hmm. if you love it and you enjoy it, like more power to you. Yeah. Um, and you can there's different formats that you can do, too. Like For so sure. Savvy Series is um, a live series. So it's not necessarily oh, okay. that you sit down and do um, like a self-paced course. Um, cause I have been experimenting with that more too. Like as a course junkie, I mm-hmm. have so many unfinished courses that yeah. I haven't done. And, um, I've been taking more like live workshops late recently or like, mm. um, like little mini masterminds or, um, mm-hmm. just like courses where you, they're not really even courses. Like you just show up and it's like an hour long workshop and then cool. you're done. You don't have to do any homework. Yeah. Like you can listen and work. Um, and I've really enjoyed that because it takes the pressure off of feeling like I didn't complete something. Um, and so I've been enjoying this savvy series, um, workshop because it's just like three live series, three live workshops. 
in a series and, um, it's been nice too. And I'll be able to update it each time. Um, yeah. so yeah, there's nice. different formats you can do depending yeah. on what and works for you. Brand, brand process savvy, just for the people that are listening, you say self-paced about how mm-hmm. long, like what's the full duration of that course, would you say? Um, it's, I think it's like eight modules. Like it's pretty long. It's pretty meaty. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of like templates that you get with it as well. So, cool. um, like project proposal template, creative direction, brand strategy, basically everything I use, like, um, right. the brand style guide, brand presentation. Um, and then like all of the swipe copy that I use in my, basically you just can copy my whole process and yeah. <laughs> adapt it for your own. <laughs> right. So it's pretty meaty. Um, and, cool. and be- because it's not something that, you know, it's like 10 years of my uh, expertise yeah. in one course. So it's ideally it's something that people can come back to as they, um, develop their process and learn. But I would say you could probably get through it, um, in a couple of weeks if you really sat down. So it'd be a really fun, like, like summer school project for somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if you're a recent grad and you're thinking you want to do what we do and, and sit down and kind of get the whole download, that seems like a really good opportunity. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Love it. One question that we're asking everyone on the podcast this year, and really because we started recording the beginning of the year, and I think everyone on TikTok was doing this trend, is like something you'd like to take with you and something you'd like to leave behind. So what's like an energy or a vibe or a habit that you are looking forward to embracing more of? And what's something that you could be happy to never see again? (laughs) Um, Embracing more of my own expect, like, Okay. Something, uh, let me, let me do the second part first. (laughs) Something I want to leave leave behind Uh is, um, what I feel like are expectations of that other people have of me. Mm -hmm. Um, because ultimately those don't really matter other than like Mm -hmm. my very close loved ones. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so leaving behind what I feel like I should be doing and what's expected of me and then moving towards what I actually really want to be doing and what feels right. And whether Mm -hmm. that's traveling more, working more, or, um, taking the afternoon off, leaning in towards what, like what feels good for me Mm -hmm. instead of what I feel like I should be doing. Ooh, I love those answers. Do you have any good travel plans? Um, yeah, we're going to New Zealand and Fiji and, um, (gasps) in June. Yeah. So I actually, yeah, I didn't leave, I didn't talk about this part, but I actually grew up in New Zealand. Um, yeah, I lived there from like eight years old to 18 and my parents still live there. So we're going to go home and visit them. And then I have a very dear friend that lives in Fiji. And so we're going to go see her too. So, Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. (laughs) That sounds amazing. Well, where can everyone find you, follow you, hopefully see pictures and everything from your New Zealand or Fiji trip? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> plug, plug it, plug it, girl. I know. So yeah, studioseaside.com for, um, for clients and designers, uh, to get everything info for courses and services. And then at studio.seaside on all social to find me. So mainly Instagram and TikTok is where I hang out. So yeah. say hi, shoot me a DM. I'd love to say hi to fellow designers. Oh yeah. You know, if you have any questions. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Well, thanks so much for your time. And thanks everybody for listening. We'll catch you later. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.